Greetings from the parlor. It feels good to be back. It seems like ages since I did a show in here. In fact, it was two weeks ago from today that we left for England, which just goes to show how time does fly when you're having fun, as opposed to the actual flight, which did not fly by. And I'm here in the final installment of my Division Retro Classic from Henson, furnished by Samir and Tony Thank you guys if you like this as much as I do because it reminds you of your youth. I put a link in the description below and we're straight back into the thick of it with a European quarterfinal. Something Unai Emery has not lost since his very first European quarterfinal. Since then, he's rattled off seven straight wins at this stage. Let's review Villa 2, Lille 1. Uh. A couple of interesting milestones achieved on Thursday. It was Aston Villa's 100th European game in our illustrious history, and it was Unai Emery's 1,000th game in charge as a manager, which is absolutely incredible, and it was beautifully commemorated by some TIFO at Villa Park. Nice job on that. But it will be remembered not just as a slender win, it will be remembered as being a very difficult outing. And I know I said in the previous show that Villa should be expected to beat an opponent like Lille because the Premier League is so demanding and our squad value in Euros is double what it is for Lille. But whew, that was a good opponent. And if you think they played well at Villa Park, well, they have been excellent at home. Lille hadn't played since last Friday, and I know it's just a day, but they did look at the outset like the fresher and more crisp team. I mean, they were moving the ball beautifully and circulating it around. In fact, it reminded me a little bit of us from the earlier stages of the season, bypassing the press, finding the open player. And this is a club, you know, that has done some excellent recruitment and then moved on some really big names. If you look back over the last couple of seasons, that seems to be the MO in France for certain clubs. You know, you do a great job of recruitment, develop, and then move on. So this is not going to be straightforward next Thursday. I was impressed with Lille. And then three days later, we have Bournemouth coming to town for what will be a crucial three points in the Champions League chase. Welcome officially to the Holy Trinity show, now back home in the colonies after a wonderful trip to B6. And this is where I lay out the three key issues and moments that defined Villa's slender and, should I say, slightly flattering win over a team that is also currently challenging for Champions League football again, a club that is not far removed from winning Ligue 1 in shocking manner over PSG a couple of seasons back. Remember that? Our two senior video correspondents, Samir Gaby and Alex Dutton, were there at Villa Park gathering B-roll on a Thursday night, which I deeply appreciate. And based on numbers, the home side, you know, were kind of second best Lille had a better XG, more shots on target, were more accurate with their passing, and they created three big chances to R1. The difference is, we took our chances. And an important factor in this match was how we caught the French outfit offside six times, and that would be significant, especially in the second half. Unai Emery named an unchanged squad from the draw with Brentford. John McGinn once again playing behind Ollie Watkins. And while I do like our captain there, and of course he plays there with Scotland all the time, I did wonder at times whether he was as influential in this game as he would have wanted. Because we've seen John McGinn, especially at home in the middle of the park, take games over sometimes. And I felt like he was missing occasionally in this game. And now with Douglas Louise suspended for both Arsenal and Bournemouth, obviously McGinn will drop deeper. Does the gaffer put Tim Irigbunum in next to him and push Yuri Tielemans behind Ollie Watkins? Or does he drop Tielemans deep with 
John McGinn, I'm going to be curious to see how it lines up at the Emirates on Sunday. Important issue, or is this a question, but did we learn from our 2-0 lead letdown last Saturday? Obviously, Lille did not score three goals inside nine minutes, but they certainly had some clear-cut chances and a whole lot of the football. And I don't need to tell you that there is a huge difference between a 2-0 or ideally 3-0 lead versus a 2-1 margin heading into the second leg at a completely sold out 51,000 seat stadium. And I have to admit, for the first time in this competition, I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable about our prospects. And that's because there are some trends creeping into our game that we didn't see this time last year and that worry me. And one of those in this game was our final ball. We struggled at times when we got just into the front third, making the right decision or connecting the right pass. And I hate to say it, but that's kind of a symptom of tired minds and tired legs. And I'm not trying to make excuses here, but you know, most of the guys playing on the park right now have played more football this season than in their entire careers in a season, especially because they don't have others to come and supplement them at times, given all the injuries, etc. The one time we did have a very fluid move in that first half, it wound up on the feet of Leon Bailey. He switched feet, actually, and curled it wide of the top corner. I just feel like if this game was played earlier this season, we might have had a comfortable lead by halftime. Big moment. V. A. R. As you know, the world is about to adopt the new IFAB regulations on offside, and that interpretation is going to completely change that law and possibly the game. And the Premier League is seriously considering employing the semi automated offside tracking technology. And I'll be very curious to know whether it streamlines that whole process because it's ruined the game. But what I really want to know is how it will affect Aston Villa's philosophy of playing a very high and tight line. Because on Thursday, we caught Lille offside six times, delayed flags on a couple of those. But on one of those occasions... We required a lengthy review. The Goodmanson goal, which was eventually chalked off, was scored at the 63rd minute. So had it counted, Lille would have had around another half hour to go and try and chase the equalizer. And even at that stage, it did not feel like we fancied going hard after a 3-0 goal. Is that partially because of what happened against Brentford on Saturday? Was it because we were trying to conserve some petrol? in the tank either way when that goal was chalked off that was a major psychological lift to Villa and a big blow to Lille and a momentum changing moment for me big issue number three the 2-1 goal it eventually did come for Lille 20 minutes after they thought they had pulled one back and the sequence that preceded the corner from which they scored did have a slight whiff of Keystone Cops to it because we were really struggling with the onslaught at that stage. And from that corner, the goal scorer was unmarked. Diego Carlos late to react. And what worries me is I have been saying that about our central defenders for the last month or more. A cross did us in again. What I've always struggled with on zonal marking or a hybrid zonal marking system is that if you are a defender tasked with marking space, you are stationary while attackers are able to run at you and leap at you. It feels like a mismatch because there you are the attacker is running and has the momentum and can leap and you're in a standing position you have to do a standing leap it just feels like there's only ever going to be one outcome now the ball across is perfect and the header also perfect and from that distance it's virtually impossible for the goalkeeper to do anything big issue number two set piece prowess all three goals in this game were scored from dead ball situations, including the one that I was just speaking of previously. 
And the opening goal was a combination of a couple of things. One, an absolutely perfectly flighted, weighted, and distanced ball from John McGinn, who purposely overhits it to the back stick where Big Morgs, Morgan Rogers, maybe throws a slight pick, as they would say in basketball, to prevent a defender from getting close to Ollie Watkins. And that's why... He has enough time in that circumstance to light a cigar and pour a glass of cognac before he delivers the crucial header home. And the reason why it was so easy was because of Rodgers and the Lille players were lobbying the Norwegian referee long and hard saying that that should have been a foul because he did kind of interfere a little bit with one of the defenders. I thought it was a very good outing again for the big man, and it's a shame that he couldn't connect on one more pass or beat a guy and have a go to give us a little bit of breathing room in that first half. The only mistake he made really was the backward pass to nobody, which ended up being a counterattack and a big save by Emmy Martinez. But those 21-year-old legs of Morgan Rogers are going to be relied on pretty heavily down the stretch. The second goal was even more crafty and it actually came after a series of other what I would call nifty routines, including one where Yuri Tielemans nearly extended the lead and would have had it not been for a player lying prone in the penalty area who deflected it wide. And for this, we have to give lots of credit to Nanny McPhee because his avant-garde schemes and situations are flummoxing opponents and keeping them guessing. Now, I would characterize this as a quietish outing by John McGinn's standards. You may disagree with me on that, but we can take nothing away from this finish. And for this, we also have to credit Austin McPhee because one of his jobs is working with players individually to maximize their accuracy and power and... Boy, did it work in this case. Villa uses that golf swing analysis tool, TrackMan, and they found with John McGinn that he can generate as much power with his instep as he can with his laces, and that's probably because of that big old beefy bottom of his where the power is generated from. So you look at this finish from behind. It is amazing how much shape McGinn puts on that ball with his left instep. It looks like it's going way wide. It freezes the goalkeeper and then nestles beautifully inside the post. I mean, this is sexy to watch. And again, it all comes down to Austin McPhee and his sort of finishing school, polishing the apple, and he is truly earning his keep with this club, at least on the attacking side of free kicks and finishing anyway. Just before we get to number one, I'm excited to reveal one of the side projects I was working on during my time in England, and this was almost entirely facilitated by my amazing sponsor, 24-7 Services, and it's a series of conversations, long form, with some of the most influential Aston Villa individuals of all time, talking about their lives, talking about football, their careers, and of course, their time with the Villa. And Paul Hansaker of 24-7 Services is friends with a lot of these guys, so he helped set it up along with our good friend Jerry O'Halloran, and we're going to release those in the off-season while chasing other guests for future versions of this series. And they were shot at the Sutton Sports and Social Club, which is a wonderful and warm and charming backdrop for these kinds of conversations. So if you've never been there, may I suggest you shoot a game of pool, play some darts, get Emma to pour you a nice cold pint, maybe book your next party or event at the Sutton Sports and Social Club, which, by the way, is kind of like a smaller version of the Phoenix Club in Phoenix Nights, which was one of my favorite comedies of all time, only without Mr. Potter and the two guys at the door, the bouncers. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? And the number one big issue that defined Villa 2, Lille 1, Magnificent Martinez. This is one of the reasons why I'm mildly non-confident about the state of this tie. It's how heavily we relied on Big Debu. I mean, he made six saves in this game, and I'm thinking three or four at least are of the monstrous variety. Any of those go in, and this tie is turned on its head. Now, it's not hard to expect that the world number one 
could potentially pull off a similar type performance away from home at Lille next week. But that is asking an awful lot. And don't forget, he's got a game at his former club, Arsenal, in between that time. Now, I guess we could also ask the question as to why Lille was able to get into these prime goal-scoring situations so often. And yes, Aston Villa has lost something in its defensive resoluteness, shall we say, compared with last year, even though we didn't play as many games in the run-in last year. But you know what? This is a good team. I was shocked. And they're in good form, and they're well-coached. And if we think the performance that we put out this past Thursday is going to get it done next week in northern France, well then... I'm afraid we're going to be seeing a lot of refunds on those Athens hotel deposits. Next up, though, ho-hum, just a straightforward trip to the Arsenal, a team that's chasing the Premier League title and is still involved in the Champions League, and we have no Douglas Louise. I actually thought they were okay against Bayern Munich, a bit of an odd game, but I could see them going to the Allianz Arena and winning in the second leg and moving on from there. And you know, we all kind of should be hoping for that to happen because of this coefficient situation. Same with Manchester City and their tie with Real Madrid. Liverpool was losing 3-0 at home to Atalanta, and that coefficient situation will impact whether England gets a fifth Champions League berth. And I would be very curious to know, behind the scenes... What the brain trust at Arsenal is thinking in terms of prioritizing their competitions and what they are doing to try to manage both of those. I have to think that the number one priority is winning the Premier League simply because of the tradition of it, how long it's been since they've won it, and the challenge and difficulty of the Premier League. The Gunners' last loss in the Premier League was at home to Liverpool in January, and the only other loss they've had was away at Porto in the Champions League. Otherwise, undefeated, tied for first in the Premier League with Liverpool, and expected to take maximum points on Sunday. So the pressure is squarely on Mikel Arteta's side this weekend. And you know, sometimes, like last year, there was a tendency to slip up, even at home. And this is football. Anything can happen. It's just that I don't expect it's going to happen this weekend. And boy, does it feel like a lifetime ago since we went to the Emirates in the pouring rain and won 3-0 during that COVID lockout season. Whew, I'll tell you what, Sandra and I were hit hard by jet lag upon returning from England. We were way worse this time than last year when we went over. I mean, seriously, these last couple of days, we, we felt like, well, John Duran's car. And why was I not surprised to wake up on a Thursday morning and read this kind of news on a match day. I mean, the only thing that would have been less surprising is if the other car had been driven by Nicolo Zaniolo, and it would have been a Maserati or something, wouldn't it? Anyway, the good news is John Duran is fine. His insurance premiums, on the other hand, well, that's another matter. Until gulp our trip to Arsenal, be well, and as always, up the mighty villa. <laughs>